20 years ago this week, the United States launched its invasion of Iraq, a move that members of U.S. President George W. Bush's administration had been planning for months, if not years. In the run-up to the war, the administration and its surrogates went into overdrive, pushing the narrative that Iraq and its leader, Saddam Hussein, posed an immediate and significant threat to the United States. Most of the media uncritically repeated dubious claims about weapons of mass destruction and possible links to al-Qaeda, claims that were thoroughly debunked in the months and years that followed. So how complicit was the media in selling the Iraq war to the public? And has the press learned any lessons from past failures? That's our discussion this week in an Upfront Special. Joining us today is Katrina Vanden Heuvel, publisher and editorial director of The Nation, Norman Solomon, founder and executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy and author of War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death, and Peter Oborn, former chief political commentator for The Daily Telegraph and author of The Rise of Political Lying. I want to thank you all for joining me on Upfront. Katrina, I'm going to start with you. Uh, in the lead up to the Iraq war, we saw officials and surrogates uh, for the administration of then U.S. President George W. Bush making the rounds in the press. And during those press rounds, it seemed like they were making a real effort to link the security of the United States uh, post 9-11 to an imminent threat from Iraq. Uh, can you walk us through the administration's strategy to sell this Iraq war to the general public? Well, the administration was determined to sell this war, uh, knowing, as we know now, that they didn't believe there was a tie between uh, the attacks of 9-11 and Iraq, but that there was a shock therapy plan uh, to undermine and regime change Iraq. And it was one of the media's greatest failures to date in accepting and failing to be a skeptic. Many said, Norman Solomon and others, media ended up being lapdogs, not watchdogs. There was a failure of skepticism there was an acceptance of what was a lie. And just one example in the two weeks leading up to the war, on TV you had one of say 200 pundits, commentators, military experts, one who raised questions or any skepticism about going to war. That is a failure and it wasn't just Fox, but it was the liberal kind of intelligentsia, the David Remnick's, Jeff Goldberg's, of the Atlantic, Jonathan Chait, Ezra Klein. These were ones who, including the think tanks in Washington, lubricated the way for the lies of the White House. Norman, uh, can you pick up on that idea uh, that Katrina's laying out here? I mean, there's the Bush strategy. There are the surrogates, there are the people who echo talking points. And then there is this press failure that Katrina just referenced, right? Um, there were some exceptions. There were people who pushed back. There were people who were skeptical, but in general, there seemed to be a, a commitment to blindly repeating the Bush administration's talking points with almost no scrutiny. The question to me is why? Why would a media infrastructure allow that to happen? The conformity is so extreme. And when we have exceptions, uh, that's not the essence of propaganda. The essence is repetition. Uh, the code words, the catchphrases, the frame of reference, and the assumptions that the United States has the prerogative uh, to try to work its will on the world, including militarily, to the extent that it seems strategically advisable and pragmatically possible. And so I think we had uh, not only the careerist conformity and opportunism, uh, but also the institutional interlock with what has been called the military-industrial complex, and that really continues, so that the echo chamber was not simply a problem with... Uh, individual uh, career drive, but also really the very structure of media, the way that the advertising and the ownership uh, intersects and uh, is interwoven with the entire political economy and government. I think some of the why can be answered uh, by examining the revolving door, not only literally between media and uh, government officials, but psychologically, there's a sort of a whirly gig it goes around. What do you around. mean when you say that? We're when you talk about the revolving door in the world, what, what do you mean exactly? Well, I mean that the uh, personnel often uh, move from government to media and vice versa. And also the assumptions about U.S. prerogatives and policies 
are also shared in that way. And quite literally, when we talk about the lead up to uh, the invasion of Iraq just about 20 years ago now, we have a situation where there would be from the vice president's office, Dick Cheney, from Rumsfeld at the Pentagon and so forth, uh, lies planted and leaked to people like Judith Miller and Michael Gordon at the New York Times. They would be front page. And then those lies about supposed weapons of mass destruction in Iraq would be cited by uh, Bush and Cheney and others. See, uh, it's not just us saying it, it's the news media. So this recycling was very insidious. Uh Peter, there are multiple pieces to these strategies, particularly when you look at them in a global context. Uh, in the UK, the message uh, from Prime Minister Tony Blair at the time uh, took on a slightly different focus than the one in the US. It was less about the imminent threat and the looming danger at the onset. Uh, and it was more that the country was going to war uh, as a moral duty uh, to liberate Iraq from Saddam Hussein, a dictator with a uh, track record, a long track record of human rights abuses. Uh, Blair even once wrote, quote, the moral case against war has a moral answer. It is the moral case for removing Saddam. How effective was that strategy in garnering uh, support for the war? Well, clearly Mr. Blair did think there was a moral case for war, but actually he was extremely um, diligent in inventing uh, false facts about Saddam, which were then picked up in the United States. You must remember that in Britain produced uh, the uh, dossier on weapons of mass destruction with the notorious claim um, of 45 minutes from destruction, uh, that the ability that Saddam had to apparently unleash uh, chemical uh, weapons and biological weapons on British forces in that time. And it was, it was a fabrication. Was the decision to prioritize the moral urgency rather than the urgency of the, of the WMDs a strategic choice? Is that one that was more palatable to the British public? Was that one that the media was more willing to accept? What, how do you account for the difference making in terms of what they chose to focus on? Well, they, they, of course, they also had a parallel strategy of producing all kinds of uh, victims of the regime, many of whom are real. I mean, Saddam, let's not forget, it was um, a, a, a barbarous dictator. So it wasn't all nonsense. That, uh, and they were on firmer ground there that Saddam was a, a, a noxious figure. But the trouble is that wasn't a grounds for invading Iraq. It, I don't recognize what you're saying fully. Uh, the, the key contribution of Britain to this debate uh, in, uh, ahead of the war was the production of fabricated evidence that Saddam Hussein's Iraq posed a, uh, a, a, an imminent threat uh, to, to international forces and Britain. Katrina, uh, keeping in mind that this was a time just after 9-11 when it wasn't unusual at all to see the White House directly responding to journalists uh, who questioned their narrative. Uh, they warned them, they intimidated them, they accused them of being unpatriotic. Uh, what effect did that strategy have on the circumstances under which journalists were working while trying to do their jobs? Well, I think we've seen in times of war or the run-up to war the ability to uh, quiet a press corps. There were very few questions I remember in the run-up to war, the Iraq War. Helen Thomas, who's no longer with us, was one of the few who was raising tough questions, and they um, continued to marginalize her. But I want to pick up on what Norman said. It's not just the individuals, it's the news organizations, uh, which maintained a kind of warlike support um, and didn't raise the tough questions, which were clearly in need of being raised. You had uh, Judith Miller being pumped with emigre Chalabi's nonsense. But let's look at TV, for example, Norman, who was then involved with the Phil Donahue show on MSNBC, was essentially ousted. And that wasn't a personal decision. That was a corporation a fearful of taking on a president's war. Help me understand how we get there. It makes sense uh, intuitively that a journalist doesn't want to buck the system from their own news organization because you stay employed by these news organizations. Right. But there are many people who believe that 
big corporations drive government, not the other way around. Why is the big news outlet, why would a news corp, why would, it, would a GE or whomever, right, be afraid of a government, be afraid to push back or speak out against a war, to be, able, be afraid to tell the truth? Why are they afraid of administrations when they have so the power? So several, several reasons, Mark. One is, you know, in Washington often, the, the, the conformity drive is not necessarily one of oppression. It's one of seduction. Hmm. Journalists want to have access. They want to be inside. Secondly... These news organizations are not, we did a centerfold years ago where the news organizations are little cogs in big corporations which have business in Washington, regulatory and other business. So there's that web. And then there's just the mindset. I remember doing Chris Matthews' Sunday show, and I said I thought you, uh, Iraq was a war of aggression. David Gregory, all six, five of him, stood up, loomed over me and said, how dare you say that? That is un-American. I think to be American is to be unyielding in defense of civil rights, civil liberties, of justice, and of speaking, you know, truth to power. The problem is those in power often know the truth. Norman, you and Katrina have started to talk about this relationship between uh, the professional and political pressures applied to journalists to get them to conform and some people who just decided that it was best for their career. It was just good business to go along with this war. I'm always trying to understand what the ratio is there just a little bit. I mean, you know, how much of this is that we're pressured, our jobs are making us do it, uh, there's a military industrial complex that forces our hand and shapes our consciousness, and how much of it is, you know what, that line is shorter, it's much easier to be on the front page if I just take this approach. How much of it is the latter? Because I'm, I'm starting to become more and more cynical as I get old. Maybe you're becoming more realistic. Yeah, the lines get uh, shorter when you get more rewards. There's a lot more uh, goodies there. And this is where the line between political analysis and psychoanalysis uh, becomes rather thin. Um, and Katrina mentioned seduction, and I think it's a very key point because, yes, there are punishments for stepping out of line, and there are a lot of rewards uh, for staying in line and Going out on a limb is not very helpful to careers if you think it's going to crack and there's not a mattress underneath to uh, cushion your fall. And so we have examples in both directions uh, where, for instance, David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, wrote a de facto editorial a couple of months before the invasion of Iraq 20 years ago, calling for that evasion in a, in a clarion call uh, piece. And he edited a magazine during the months before the invasion, which repeatedly published articles that claimed that there was a direct tie between Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda and 9-11, complete falsehoods. Well, as we speak, David Remnick is still the editor of The New Yorker. There's no accountability whatsoever. Whereas people who did step out of line, for instance, Bill Donahue, whose show was canceled a few weeks before the invasion of Iraq, according to leaked memos from NBC, MSNBC, precisely because he allowed anti-war voices, a minority of voices on the show, but still voices allowed on his program. That was unacceptable because the memo from NBC that was leaked said that the competitors like Fox would be waving the flag as the uh, bombs fell on Baghdad. They didn't want to be the odd network out. Peter, what's your assessment of, you know, how much of this is just raw, naked self-interest and opportunism versus the kind of broader structural pressure? Uh, and then two, uh, was it really uh, a situation where if you didn't go along with the system, your, it was career suicide? Because in some ways that at least, it doesn't justify the action, but it gives some context for it. Well, I... Um... I was taken by something which Katrina said just then, which was um, the importance of access. Um, but of course, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a story, but I think there was a, a, a collapse of a skepticism. Um, and it was also, of course, to follow up another point, that those who opposed the war were targeted. Now, in, in the British papers, I still re remember Scott Ritter, the former uh, weapons inspector, who was very eloquent about the um, 
fabrications of the Western intelligence agencies and politicians. And that the way he was covered and uh, bullied and smeared in the um, British press, I don't know what happened in the United States, was, was completely, com completely horrible. Uh, and so it, it was an unpleasant atmosphere. You know, Mark, what, what strikes me is that there was another phenomenon in the run-up to the war, not just media malpractice, but the New York Times called the protests around the world the other superpower. And mm. there was a real sense of people, a community, a global community, gathering to say no to war. That dissipated when the war began, but I think it remains. What strikes me, I don't know if this strikes Peter or Norman, is that we talk a lot about democracy in this country today and salvaging democracy. But at the nation, we've believed for 150 plus years that war, the endless war does not permit true democracy at home. Yet we have a kind of celebration of George W. and the Cheneys and people who took us into a disastrous war. There is no accountability in the system. You know, in the with all of these people speaking out against the war, with all of this critical analysis, all this deep pushback, Norman, why did the media look the other way? Why was there such an effort to silence the resistance? Because it's not like it wasn't there. Yeah. Well, it's a key point that uh, Katrina alludes to, that there was a huge disconnect between what people in the United States and around the world wanted, certainly many, many of them, including millions on the streets, and what was coming from the mass media. And I think that's uh, symptomatic of the fact that at the time, and especially uh, as a war uh, is launched, in the so-called professional ethos, if you are pro-war, you are, quote, objective. If you are anti-war, you're biased. And in retrospect, then, being pro-war based on lies means never having to say you're sorry at all. And so that is both a history that is distorted uh, in real time or very quickly after, and also prefigurative. So the cliche really applies that uh, the first casualty of war is truth. And we have that not only in retrospect, but right now where we have um, a group think that is continual and the circumstances change, but the dynamic stays largely the same. So. In 2023, we can have Antony Blinken and uh, the president of the United States, Joe Biden, saying that it is absolutely unacceptable for one country to invade another. And yet those two folks teamed up for bogus hearings of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the middle of 2002 with Biden as senator chair and Blinken as chief of staff railroading through, excluding dissenting voices, railroading through the conventional wisdom that was accumulating that it was essential to invade Iraq. So we are in Orwellian territory here. And, and I guess what's stunning to me, uh, Peter, you know, I, I heard Katrina talk about, uh, you know, being not just shouted down and intimidated, but profoundly rejected by the American media when she has the audacity to call the Iraq war a war of aggression. Does that happen now? Uh, do we see the same kinds of intimidation and silencing? Is there more space for dissent? Is there more space for critical pushback? And is the media willing to cover it? I think the answer to that question is no. Um, I, I accept that, um, you know, on the fringes of the internet or whatever, but, uh, and super papers I discovered during the Iraq war, the nation, thank you for educating me, the nation, <laughs> and at Al Jazeera, didn't you get bombs for your pains? Um, so there were voices which uh, at the time were very bravely sticking up uh, against the war movement. But in my observation about, um, uh, about the Ukraine debate, uh, certainly in Britain, I don't want to talk for the United States, um, is actually it's more constrained. It's, it, I, was, uh, mm. I was watching the debate in Parliament um, uh, a few weeks ago, when the, the discussion was, you know, well, what to do about Ukraine, and everybody was for driving the, escalating the war. Uh, the, 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 you know, not the British Prime Minister, the, the leader of the Labour Party, the leader of the Scottish National Party, the leader of the Lib Dems. And what you've lost 
is any 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 even of the marginal voice. And, and I wonder before we go, I, I wonder how much of it is how we analyze the circumstance. The word groupthink has come up in this conversation multiple times, and it keeps lingering in my mind and troubling me a little bit. I, I, I think about um, how reporters, with the benefit of some, of some hindsight, have attempted to make sense of their failure to cover the Iraq war properly in other situations. Uh, investigative reporter Bob Woodward, for example, admitted to not doing enough, but he ultimately blamed once again, groupthink as the reason why he didn't further question the rationale for war. Uh, writing for Bloomberg in 2013, Ezra Klein, another name who's come up in this conversation, he apologized for supporting the war. He, he said he was too young. Yes, he said, I was a young <laughs> and dumb college no. student. He didn't get drunk at a frat party. He, he helped beat a war drum. This is something quite different. Does this approach demonstrate the media's unwillingness to actually address its failures by framing them as individual choices, right, rather than symptoms of an actual structural problem? I'm going to give you all an opportunity to respond to that. Uh, I'll start with you, Norman. Well, it's just something that's not often talked about. Uh, it's avoided because the structure of corporate power interlocked with the military-industrial complex is very unpleasant. Now, um, you know, repentance and redemption is uh, very uh, mooted, muted, really, in the U.S. Uh, I think it was Edward Said who pointed out that one of the uh, huge uh, crimes, if you will, of the uh, Western powers in the Middle East is a complete lack of remorse. There's still no remorse about what's being done to Palestinian people from the United States, certainly not in Israel either. And so we have this dynamic going on where uh, people are absolutely encouraged to uh, say, well, we made some mistakes. Of course, other people are suffering and dying as a result of the mistakes. But uh, gee, hopefully, we hopefully do better next time, which reminds me of something I think attributed to Mark Twain. It's easy to quit smoking. I've done it thousands of times. <laughs> that, 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 that is perfectly apt. Peter? Well, it is simply the case that the media will never, ever, under any circumstances, admit to having got anything uh, wrong. Um, certain, uh, unless forced to in a court of law, and that's normally something specific, but massive errors of judgment of this nature, it will, they, they will never admit it. They will always blame somebody else for implementing, implementing it badly or somebody else for producing the false information. The media never makes mistakes. Never forget that. I think um, the structural piece of media power is critical to understand. It's not just individual journalists, but they do have some power, as Norman was talking about David Remnick and his cohort. Again, the bar to dissent and dissent with reporting and facts and values is not high in this country. A Russian poet, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, used to say, why is it you love other countries' dis dissidents so much and not your own? And I think there's something to that, and that people inside Washington understand, as I said earlier, it's not through oppression, suppression, but it is seduction if you want to be close to the rings of power. And I think that's what we have to work against. And if I might, you know, there are two, three, four medias in this nano second changing volatile media landscape. And I think a younger generation isn't necessarily watching the old TV. Now, will that change mindsets? And I do think many people in this country are listening to other things other than the think tanks, the reports, the administration. Um, just to say briefly, the uh, landscape of the world changed as a result of the Iraq war. In uh, 2007, Putin gave this famous speech at the Munich Security Conference talking about the end of a unipolar world. And I do think the Iraq war in many ways and the debacle, the legacy of debacle has changed the nature of the power coordinates of this world. And that should be remembered too as we move into more and more wars and tr try and find alternatives to war if possible. Katrina, Norman, Peter, I want to thank you all for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, that is our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.